Hi, and welcome. Thanks for joining us for this conversation, Leaving Afghanistan with New America's Afghanistan Observatory Scholars, Mir Abdullamiri, Kumaira Rabin, and Vanessa Ghazari from our partner, The Intercept. I'm Candace Rondeau. I'm the Director of Future Frontlines at New America and a Professor of Practice at the Center on the Future of War at Arizona State University in the School of Politics and Global Studies. A few months ago, really a year ago, when the Taliban rose to power in Afghanistan, uh, there was a major shockwave that sent around the world. Many of you will remember this in August 2021, when the last troops um, left Afghanistan uh, and the entire country fell into chaos. At that time, uh, I was at home in Washington, D.C., and thinking about all the people I had met and lived with and worked with over the years in Afghanistan, uh, wondering what, what was happening to them. And I think like many who had spent time in Afghanistan, either as civilians uh, or as members of the military or diplomatic corps, uh, I was in as much a panic as anybody else. And I think um, it goes without saying that the people who are on this uh, call today and in this conversation today also had a very similar experience. Um, and it, in part because of that experience, uh, New America came together in partnership with The Intercept last year to make sure that the voices of Afghan journalists and researchers and educators and human rights defenders were not silenced and that the country's most steadfast defenders of democracy, uh, of peace, of a more stable Afghan future could still be heard. We launched this only weeks after the fall of the US-backed government in Kabul. And the Afghanistan Observatory really sought to cultivate a network of exceptional scholars who are today remaking their lives and, and making sure that no one at home is forgotten. We've worked closely with seven scholars over the last year to help them tell their stories and the stories of their families and friends um, and the many, many Afghans who made so many sacrifices over the last 20 years under US um, backed support for the Afghan government. The result of their work is a four part podcast called No Way Home and a series of hard hitting articles that went about what went wrong with Afghanistan security forces in the final days of the former Afghan president, Ashraf Ghani's government, and what the fallout from that collapse has meant for thousands of Afghan soldiers and their families over the last year. Today, we're gonna to be talking with two of our Afghan colleagues from the Afghanistan Observatory and a key collaborator on the project uh, from The Intercept who worked in partnership with us this year. And we're gonna learn more about how all of this um, came together, but also what we learned along the way about the reasons for the collapse and the impact on, on people, real people who live this experience and what it might mean for the future of the country and for the region and for the future of US foreign policy, um, given the long legacy of the war there. So we have a brief clip from the podcast to kick us off that we'd like to play for you to get the mood going. Hamid and his family pushed through the crowds in a sewage canal until they were 100 meters from Abbey Gate. Hamid had the congressional letter we'd help him get. He was trying to show it to the soldiers outside the airport. It seemed like they had a chance. They were only 30 meters away from the gate now, and closer to reaching an American soldier who, according to our military contacts, could get them inside the airport. That's when we lost them. Such a great clip. Um, I'm just so proud <laughs> to to hear that and, and to be part of that. So before we start, I just wanna give a, a few housekeeping notes for our audience. Um, we wanna make sure that we hear from you and let you know that you do have uh, the ability to submit questions to us. If you have questions, please submit them through the Q&A function in the Slido box that uh, was noted before, and we'll get to them in the second half of the event. Um, most importantly, you can access the podcast series and stories published by The Intercept 
and New America by clicking on the link provided by our events team below. Uh, and um, you'll get a chance also to sort of um, take a look at it either by following us uh, via Future Frontlines um, or following the Intercept uh, at, inter at Intercepted uh, or going to the Intercept website. Uh, you can find all of the series outputs there, uh, including the podcast, No Way Home, and we hope you will visit that site. So let me um, quickly also turn to the speakers uh, and in introduce you to them. Uh, some really don't need introduction. I will say that my good friend, Vanessa Gazzari, doesn't need much introduction. Um, but um, if you don't know her, she is the national security editor at The Intercept. She has reported from four continents, nine countries, and many corners of the United States for outlets such as the Washington Post, Slate, and the New Republic. She's an adjunct professor at Columbia University uh, at the Journalism School and the author of The Tender Soldier, an excellent book I must recommend, um, about an experimental US military program that sent social scientists to the front lines in Iraq and Afghanistan with disastrous results. Um, and she is one of my oldest and dearest field friends um, we have reported together in many places around the world, uh, including in Afghanistan, um, and I'm really proud to um, be working with her on this project and to have her on this panel today. Uh, I am equally proud uh, and very honored to introduce Humaira Rabin. Humaira is an Afghanistan Observatory Scholar at New America. She is currently based in the UK, and she works as a researcher at the Center on, for Information Resilience. Um, back in Afghanistan, she worked with USAID, as well as the Dutch Diplomatic Mission in Afghanistan. Humaira's main area of expertise is focused on women's studies and migration. Uh, and over the last seven months, she has investigated the collapse of the Afghan Air Force. Mir Abdullah Miri, uh, another colleague of ours from the Afghanistan Observatory uh, at New America. Uh, he is, uh, of course, Afghan born and raised. And he served as a faculty member at Herat University, so that's in Western Afghanistan. Uh, and in the fall of 2021, Mir was evacuated from Kabul to the UK. Uh, and during the past seven months, he has studied the issues related to um, irregular migration following the fall of the former Republic, the Afghan Republic. So really pleased to have you all on uh, this conversation today. I, I wanted to sort of start um, to help people kind of situate themselves um, you know, a year has passed and many people might not remember exactly what it was like um, to live through the experience of watching Afghanistan uh, in free fall as the Taliban swept into Kabul. But um, let me let me start with Humaira um, and, and ask this question. I'll go around the horn. So where were you when you heard the news about the Taliban sweeping into Kabul and, and what was your first thought about what comes next? Um, thank you, Candice. I first want to say that it's a great uh, pleasure to be here um, along with um, Mir, my colleague, and also with Candice, you, Candice, and Vanessa, two of the people who have who not just have worked in Afghanistan and been there, but really deeply care about Afghanistan. Um, well, my um, story and my situation uh, when the fall happened um, is was different from most of the scholars in the program because I left Afghanistan months before the collapse and at the peak of target killings of um, activists, journalists, scholars, um, and I was women who work with international organizations. And due to my work and my background, I feel threatened and not just me, but also my colleagues and some of my friends and my networks, we left and, and we didn't know whether we will be back or not or what will happen next. So during the fall, I was in, in, in the UK with my son but my husband was in Afghanistan and my whole family members, my parents, my siblings, I mean, everyone else was um, in Afghanistan. And I, I mean, the fall itself and the days preceding to the fall would, would give, I think it's, it's common to everyone, to all Afghans, I think, was it a feeling of shock, uh, a feeling of fear and a feeling, feeling of hopelessness. Uh, but um, when the shock happened, I mean, I had the same feelings and fear for my family that what will happen to them and what will happen to to my husband because he was there. And I think that was the situation overall I would like to um, depict. Um, um, but, but still, when I when I was talking to people on the ground, I could I could feel and I could hear that they they were tiny rays of hope. Like some people would say, no, nothing will happen, or the fall wouldn't be this 
fast, but unfortunately it happened. And today we are all here scattered in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it was really hard to understand. I mean, it was, it was very chaotic. And, um, you know, there was a sense that like, maybe maybe it would be okay. Maybe maybe it wouldn't be as disastrous as, as it actually turned out to be. And um, I think just for a brief moment, I, I don't think it lasted, at least for me, it didn't last more than a couple of hours before I started to realize this is not gonna go well. But Mir, where were you and, and what were your thoughts? Uh, thank you so much, Candice. Uh, yes, Homero, you wanted to add something? Sorry, sorry, just... Okay, sure. Um, yes, um, I was uh, in Herat. It was July 2021. I was in Herat. Uh, it was the time that before the collapse of the government, the Taliban were intensifying their attacks in Herat. So the situation was chaotic. I escaped. I went to Iran. Then I was in Iran that the government collapsed. And uh, it was the time because I was working as a British, uh, as a trainer with British Council, I received a call forward that I'm eligible to get relocated to the UK. So I received an email asking me to go to the airport. So the next day I went to Herat, I received a lot of calls from authorities at the airport. They were calling me, come to the airport, come from this way. I went to Kabul uh, after the collapse. So it was very chaotic. And uh, Ashraf Ghani's escape from the country added to that chaos. So because the president escaped, I felt everyone wanted to leave the country. Everyone wanted to escape. So I was in Kabul. I couldn't enter the airport at that time because it was chaos outside the airport. And until the suicide bombing happened and foreigners left and I was stuck in Kabul for 75 days after the collapse of the government. So that's a pretty, that's a, I think everybody had a pretty horrifying experience, um, but, but being stuck there and not knowing could you get out what's coming next um that had to be pretty pretty terrifying and i think that when um for the people who are on the outside especially folks you know especially foreign journalists and, and human rights folks um i think we were all kind of thinking the worst and and I, we somewhat understood but it was a little bit abstract i think um in terms of how how that was <laughs> unfolding, you know, for, for a lot of our friends and, and people that really are practically our family. Vanessa, you, you reported in Afghanistan for years when we first met uh, back in, in Florida in, gosh, was that 2004? You had just come back from Afghanistan. Um, I hadn't been yet. I had no idea. I'd been to other places that were not so great, like the Caucasus, um, but that, that was no comparison um, to, to kind of the experience you'd had. And, um, so what, what were you thinking? Where were you at the time when the collapse happened? Thanks, Candace. I just want to thank you for that really gracious introduction. And I'm so, you know, honored to be here with you and Mir and Humaira um, and, you know, looking forward to talking about the work that they've done and that we've been doing over the last few months. Um, so when, 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 you know, I don't think of it as one day, but when this kind of thing started happening in July that led into August, where it was clear that the Taliban were advancing much more quickly than any, any of the officials at least had thought that they would or said that they would. Um, you know, I was, I was actually on the 15th of August, I was heading up to a place in Maine where my family has gone for years. And it's the one week out of the year where I try to totally unplug. Needless to say, I did not unplug at all. I was totally glued to my phone, um, like everybody I know who had worked there, trying to figure out where people were who I hadn't talked to or seen in years and whether they were okay and if there was anything I could do. And I remember swimming in a lake up there and you know, feeling, as I always had in Afghanistan, the dissonance between my situation and the situation of the Afghans I was getting to know and you know, just the... the the dissonance in the level of risk and the level of um, autonomy 
that, you know, I always had as a reporter in Afghanistan to leave anytime I wanted that Afghans didn't have. Um, and I remember just looking up at the sky and thinking, you know, at least they're under the same sky and feeling that in some way I could connect to them by some supernatural method. Um, and that was, that was sort of how I comforted myself. But I, I also do want to just say one thing because the, you know, my experience of, of, of that event um, was very much sort of funneled through my, my experience as an American, having come of age as an American journalist in that war and having learned basically all I know about my country and its operations uh, and its diplomacy and the way it, the way it handles itself in the world from watching that war. And so it's, it's just important to mention that I felt completely unnerved and um, really nauseated for weeks about having in any way been part of what the Americans <laughs> tried to do in Afghanistan, of which there were many good outcomes, but also some just absolutely disastrous uh, and terrible ones. And so I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that uh, since that day. Yeah, I think that's I think that's an experience that a lot of us had. I certainly had that experience. I um, I was at home in DC myself, uh, you know, and yeah, August is typically a time that's pretty quiet in DC. You know, people go away to vacation, and um, I was kind of looking forward to um, getting started on some some new work. Um, I I was watching, uh, you know, what was happening, you know, throughout the year, really anticipating that something like this might happen. Um, but maybe not the way exactly it came down. And, um, you know, my first thought, it was a, certainly like a flashback um, scenario because I myself had to flee the country very quickly um, because I had written something that uh, I guess the Afghan government and maybe maybe the US government didn't like particularly um, way back in, in 2012. And, you know, I left the country within six hours um, because my life was under threat. And my first thought was, about all the people that I had left behind and whether or not actually in the interim, intervening, you know, decades since I left or so, you know, had the organization that I worked for done anything to make sure that, you know, they were ready for this moment. And I, I wasn't that confident, uh, not because uh, there was something wrong with the organization, but simply because the, the speed of it probably, um, I think, really surprised a lot of NGOs that were working on the ground, and, and perhaps they just didn't have a contingency plan. Um, and, you know, of course, that turned out to be the case, I think, for a lot of organizations, um, you know, and it was immediately this kind of frenzied, you know, sleepless period of trying to figure out how to get people out uh, and where they are and, you know, uh, you know, are there their buses? Are, are they, can we get them to Abbey Gate? Uh, who who has the list? Does anybody have the list? And at the same time, the thing that was galling for me was, um, you know, I got calls from my friends in the State Department saying, do you know anything or anybody on the ground or anybody in the Pentagon who can help us get this organized, get these folks evacuated um, from some of these uh, journalistic outfits and, and human rights organizations? And I was like, you know, I haven't been in the country in 10 years almost. Uh, it was uh, nine years. And Sure, I know lots of things. Um, and then you find yourself, you know, dialing up old friends in Australia and in the UK, uh, you know, trying to pull levers here and there. Um, can we get, uh, you know, can we raise enough money to, to get a chartered plane? And then the chartered planes are leaving empty. So it was really, um, and then when the news came out um, that, that Ashraf Ghani had fled the country, uh, I think like everybody who'd ever lived in Afghanistan for like 10 minutes, you know, I'll just say it, I was pissed. I, I was so angry. Um, I just, I was, I couldn't believe that um, after all those years and all the kind of uh, posturing around the need for stability and stable governance and, you know, strong leadership, uh, not just from him, but from so many others that the Americans champion. Um, that this this was the final outcome uh, was you know the, the president of the country the commander in chief of the Afghan forces um, left the country be with his tail between his legs 
um, and barely, you know, and then the, then the rumors about the cash, you know, the bales of cash that went with him and where was the money? And um, it was just uh, the most ignoble ending you could possibly imagine. Uh, it, you know, it, and, and, and the, the ridiculous um, images of, of uh, young Afghan boys and men trying to tuck themselves into the wheel um, of, of a C-130 lifting off from the tarmac. Um, well, again, it's just one of those images that is burned in your mind permanently now and then falling off in the middle of you know, mid-flight, um, terrifying, terrifying situation. So it seemed only right that, you know, um, we try and do what we can to make sure that um, those who are responsible are not allowed to forget. And I think that that was a big motivation for me. Once we got through that initial period of trying to get people out and, and, and there's still people there um, that, you know, I think probably should get out. Um, but still that initial period, you know, sometime, a couple months later started to kind of wane. Uh, it became very obvious that something needed to be done. Uh, and, and, you know, Vesey, you're the first person I thought of, obviously, uh, and I think it was just natural that um, in some ways that we ended up collaborating together. But tell me, you know, I know this is going to sound a little bit weird, but like what was what was appealing about this project, not just for you, but for for the Intercept staff, because you had to convince people, um, you know, that this is worthwhile. I'm just curious about how you did that. Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty easy sell for for me at The Intercept. I mean, The Intercept is a very unusual news organization. It's certainly the only in a in my entire life. I've never done anything professionally except journalism, uh, really. And, and this is the only place I've ever worked that, um, you know, works in the way that that The Intercept does and really, you know, gives so much backing to um, people like me and others who are lucky enough to work there to do the projects that we really feel um, have like a strong, a strong justice component and a, and a really to raise the voices of people who are not heard in the mainstream media. Uh, I knew there would be a lot of coverage of, um, you know, the evacuation and the, the fallout from it. Um, but I also know that Afghanistan always gets forgotten. And so it, it, it bounces into the news and everybody's talking about it as what was happening last year uh, for a, actually a couple months. And then something else happens like Russia's invasion of Ukraine or any one of a number of other things. And it's like Afghanistan just doesn't exist. And, and nobody really understands why it we should be talking about it. So. You know, one one motivator for all of us at the Intercept was to keep on this story, and it's something that we think about and talk about a lot. We've 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 stayed on stories like this in Yemen and other places that a lot of other uh, news organizations have not continued to cover, um, and and so you know to get our folks involved was was um, was relatively easy. Um, I mean, I I really just want to say that this project. Um, epitomizes a kind of journalism that I've been, you know, trying to do since I was living in Afghanistan um, about that country, which is that it, it tries to really, um, you know, let me just say it like this, um, from observing the American government and military in Afghanistan, one of the things I, that was most clear to me was that um, those entities believed totally that uh, every problem had a solution and that Americans could find it. And that to me was one of the key uh, difficulties, maybe the key difficulty with the entire experiment and project that the United States had in Afghanistan. And so, you know, it was, it became very important to me from not long after I started going there and reporting there to not <laughs> think that way <laughs> and actually to try to figure out what I could about you know how how Afghans could use the resilience that all of us have seen in them to address um, the issues in their country and in their culture uh, themselves and with their own um, you know, and, and, and with, with their own with their own thinking, their own backgrounds, their own traditions and their own ideas. And, and in journalism, especially, 
um, because that's what I do. That was something I spent a lot of time thinking about and working with Afghans on. So I spent a lot of time with Afghan journalists, both when they were working to help me do my stories, but also trying to help them do, you know, set up news organizations and do things like, you know, learn how to, how to uh, take some lessons from, from international or Western journalism. Um, so, you know, I just think, I think this project has been really amazing in that most of the folks who are in the scholars program are not, have not actually been trained as journalists. But, you know, Candace, I think you know this very well, and you, you know, this was, I think, part of what you were thinking about when you developed the program is that um, being able to tell your own story in your own way and being able to ask, seek, ask for and seek uh, and get accountability from people in power who let down 30 plus million Afghans by evaporating or whatever. You know, this can be a sort of important to healing and rebuilding your identity and your life in a new place. And so, you know, all those things were at work for me as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I spent a lot of time, I, I went, in, certainly after I fled, uh, you know, I went, I went kind of into a deep little cave uh, for a number of years there, uh, didn't want my voice out there, there, didn't want my violin out there. Um, and I, you know, had I been given this opportunity, I think I would, um, I think I would have been in a different place, you know, and I, I felt like that was a big motivation for me. I, I, I can only imagine. Um, and, and when, when Mir and Humaira and, you know, the other scholars, uh, you know, put their applications in. First of all, let me just say, we received 400 applications, um, you know, for seven slots. And so it was, and there were some really outstanding people that we interviewed and talked to. Um, so Humaira and Mir are kind of like, you know, the, the shiny example of kind of rising above or kind of cream of the cream. Um, and I think that's that's something that, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you, Kamira, you know, first of all, you know, why, why did you even bother, you know, what made you think you had to do this, and, and tell us, you know, like, why it was you decided to pursue the story that you did, uh, and tell us a little bit about that story, and, uh, and the Afghan Air Force, if you can. Um, thank you, Candace. Um, so, um, my situation at the time in, in the UK, was all about grappling um, with, with the immigration processes, as you know how, how difficult it is in so many countries, unfortunately. So it was a sense of, it was grappling, and at the same time, I was separated from my husband, from my family, had like no one, not a relative even in the UK. And it was like my, my life from a person who had invested in, his, in her career for years back in Afghanistan, it was just came down to just survival, just looking for somewhere to call it home. Because for, us, for first months, um, and a refugee cannot have a place of her own or his own. So I, that was like the phase, first phase of my struggle with, with all this sense of, you know, and of hopelessness and, and so many struggles. But then slowly after, slowly, slowly going on, I, I was looking for opportunities to kind of just take my power back and just to, just kind of collect all the shattered piece of me. Um, and then came uh, the um, Afghanistan Observatory um, 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 op opportunity. And I really, the thing that I really liked about it was uh, the fact that it really um, focused on storytelling, because personally, I, I believe in power of storytelling and how it connects people and how it creates, ignites compassion. Um, and I was, I was like, I was like, no, no, I was like, it was like zero confidence that I would go uh, further and even be able to be shortlisted or interviewed. Um, but luckily I got the opportunity and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and when it comes to the story I worked on, um, so it's a, a wider perspective. It was the importance of Afghan Air Force like uh, like for security forces like Afghanistan, how important this air force has been, and the collapse of the air force meant the collapse of everything, and that that was that was the thing that happened actually. So for me, it was like just let's let's investigate and see what went wrong and how things went um, ended up um, 
and a mess and things kind of collapsed and yet first in the um, Afghan Air Force. And the second thing about the story that really was intriguing and touched me was the fact that a, a number of people, a number of pilots, um, they, they made a decision that was just not a personal decision, but it was like had bigger impacts, not just for, for them, for the country, for the people, for even for the region and wider region uh, like uh, in countries in the West, like the US. And coming to a personal level, why, I mean, that was a like wider perspective, but personally, I, I think um, commanders, um, ministers, deputy ministers, all these people, they always had platforms. They always had, um, and they still do have. I mean, today, if you see the panel, most of the panel discussions, most of the programs, they are given back to those people who, are, who, are, who, have, who have, have been always there. I mean, they always have platforms to say what, every, why everything, and they kind of continue blame, blaming each other for the collapse. But for me, it was like important to see like a person who made a decision and he was not a leader, he was not a decision maker, but he made a decision at a personal level and he has no voice, nobody listens to him. Like the pilot who's featured in our story, he went through a lot of um, stress, a lot of confusion at the time the collapse happened and he had to take a uh, kind of, has to take, uh, had to take a decision and leave the country. So for that, for the, that, that sake, to give another person the chance to have a voice, to share what they want to say. I think they, these pilots and other people featured in other stories, they made um, history, but they never had the chance to uh, write the history. So I think this platform was a, an opportunity for them to, to just be there and share what they felt and how things went wrong, wrong from their perspective. And another thing would be, was the sense of hesitation between leaving or remaining it's i think it's something that has been always in lives of afghans over the four decades of war like should i leave should i remain in this country what what if i leave would i remain so this part also was really uh near to my heart because when i left afghanistan my family my husband behind um this was the thing i was feeling whether i if i stay what if somebody kills me if i leave what will happen and 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 of course, the sense of separation that um, Ahmadi featured in story has of being away from his family. I had the same experience and many millions of Afghans have the experience like families are separated, scattered, and their chances of getting together is not easy or takes time. So I think it was like wider security perspective and also some personal um, um, feelings and attachment to the story that kind of led me to work on this. And I'm, I'm grateful that I had your guidance on this and we worked together on it. Well, it, the, the pleasure was mine for sure. Uh, I mean, I learned, I you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about the Afghan security forces over the years, uh, but I, I learned more than I thought there was to know about kind of the mechanics, just the basics of like, you know, what does it mean to um, exfiltrate hundreds of helicopters and biplanes and like did anybody think about that and it was what was clear I mean from our reporting that for me anyway was um there wasn't a plan or if there was a plan it somehow disintegrated or people kind of lost connection with it um that there was just so much chaos um and then you know Amadi who you found of course um which was a remarkable find as a as a, as a character as a person uh, and he was willing to talk to you first of all and just tell his entire story you know when when you did that first interview and it became clear that he'd been sort of given this order, but like by whom um, to fly out of the country uh, with the plane, you know, the PC-12 that was used on all of these different US backed operations, right? Um, you know, then, then I was sort of like, well, who the hell gave that order? And, you know, and so it was kind of like also unraveling a mystery. So it was a really, um, it was an interesting story to pursue um, but I think to the point that you just made, Myra, uh, earlier about, you know, the choice that we had with this program and this project, um, there was no amount of cajoling. Uh, you know, there was just, it was unending from Afghan elites who were knocking on the door saying, you know, give us a birth, give us a place, give us a fellowship, give us a platform. 
um, even from some of my very dear friends uh, whom I still respect, you know, for pressuring us to, to kind of give the mic yet again to the same people who, of course, uh, you know, had been through something. But the reality was like, you know, we've been hearing from those same people for 20 years and the outcome was the same. Uh, it seemed like we just, we really needed to hear um, different stories from different voices this time around. And, and that's why, Mir, when you applied, um, and, and first of all, your writing was so beautiful. Uh, it came so, through so beautifully uh, in your application, but also just, um, you know, the warmth of your personality came through so quickly. You know, everything that we've done here is by Zoom, <laughs> for the most part, with a few meetings here and there. Um, so tell us a little bit more about so why why you decided to pursue the story that you you picked up, which was of course the story of your cousin, uh, who is featured in your podcast episode, um, and his journey, uh, his attempt to leave the country. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, thank you so much, Candice. Um, so, a quick self promotion. Um, I did episode two. It's called the Desert of Death. I really encourage everyone to listen and share uh, their feedback with us. In that story, um, as all of the topics we explored were related to Afghanistan, of course, the concept of ownership was there, but my story was one step further. It was a family story. It was the story of my cousin during the time I was struggling to leave Afghanistan. I was stuck in Kabul. I was in a hotel when I received the call that uh, my cousin has passed away while crossing the border to Iran. So then uh, the time I was searching, looking for ways to get out, I had to uh, find ways to find his body. And it was a difficult journey. Um, as uh, Vanessa mentioned, and as you mentioned, my background was not in journalism, and um, but I was interested in issues related to access and equity. Even as an educational researcher, I look at that identity in teachers and learners. So for me, the story was very important because it was a family story. And of course, when I became a refugee, something I'd never thought about, I wanted to explore some of the struggles, some of the um, experiences uh, these refugees and migrants have been experiencing. And I hope the podcast, the episode, provides some a small comfort for them, that their story is being heard and the prayers of others are for them. And yeah, this is at least a small thing I could do um, related to um, this family story. But he really, um, I mean, he had a really interesting background too. I thought, you know, what was interesting is that, you know, your cousin, um, he was kind of, he liked computers. He was like sort of this very self-taught, um, very driven guy uh, who, you know, just against all odds, he kind of made something out of himself and, yeah. and was, I think what comes through in the episode and, and the, in the reporting for me anyway, is, this is a guy who was not going to allow his family, um, his his wife and his children, to um, just kind of wither away under the Taliban rule. And uh, you know he wasn't going to have his chance taken away from him when he wasn't going to let the Taliban take um, his family chance, his family's chance away from from them. And he made this kind of fateful decision. Um, unlike you, like you you did have somebody to help help you at least. Um, at least support you through the process, even though I'm sure that didn't really feel like that at the time. Um, your cousin just made this big leap. Um, tell us a little bit about the leap that he made and, and paint the picture for us. So I would describe this situation as um, a chaotic um, thing happens uh, that everyone feels is scared and everyone wants to leave. So my cousin wasn't like someone who had connections or relationship with foreigners, with Americans or with um, other foreigners. He was a low class or middle class person in Afghanistan. 
it was only a couple of years and until he found he he could find he could uh, mm, let's say have a normal life in Afghanistan that the insecurity happened um, so when the Taliban came he uh, he had struggles with economics as well financial support he even he started looking for other jobs then when he saw that everyone is leaving he decided to leave I had even I even had a short conversation with him in July before I escaped to Iran he told me about his plan to go to Germany but I didn't know that he wanted to, to choose the illegal route to go uh, with the smugglers because when the uh, collapse happened so the passport offices were closed then people uh, couldn't obtain the proper travel documents to leave the country so I would describe the situation as everyone wanted to leave and I would say even most of those who didn't want to leave at the beginning and would claim that um the Taliban are different this time they have changed their mind and they are leaving yeah you know I, I was also struck by the the story of his wife who had to I mean I'm not going to give a spoiler away I think I won't do that but uh I mean it, you un, you unravel the mystery of um kind of what happened uh in a way that I think also gets at the other thing that Afghans experience, or you know, I'm sure millions, especially those who left, which is this kind of like unresolved mm -hmm. set of questions about people that were left behind or that were killed or that, um, you know, and so, I mean, I wonder like now a year on, what questions you still have about either what happened um, or what questions are kind of lingering for you? And I, I would put that question also to Myra as well. So, so of course, in terms of uh, Aziz's story, the character I explored, my cousin, um, it was a mystery what happened to him while he wanted to cross the border. Uh, the major problem was that he chose a smuggling route and a smuggling, the name is on it. There's no truth. Everyone would lie. So they have to lie to help you cross the border. So the stories we were collecting from the smugglers, uh, we couldn't trust, we couldn't find the uh, correct story in terms of what happened. Um, it's as if uh, they cheated on him and they killed him. And the problem is we don't have clear policies in terms of smuggling in Afghanistan. Um, that's why we cannot chase and um, through the government and, and see like who, who was guilty in the process. Yeah, that, that was a problem with the. Yeah, there's no resolution, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. What about you, Humaira? Do you still have questions that you, you know, that are unresolved for you either about what happened with the Air Force or just the experience yourself of, you know, of leaving? There's still some unresolved questions, I think. Um, yet, to, to an extent, yes. Um, there are so many things that should be asked be, uh, uh, from people, especially those in power, like the commander of chief of the country, President Ghani, he, fell, he fled the country um, when everybody was Every everybody's eyes, like all was uh, all people were eyes to him, and he would would look up to him that what what he was gonna do. I mean, I remember when I was talking to my sister, um, a day before the collapse, and she was like, "Oh, I, I really hope that there comes an interim government or something, or resolution or something that suddenly everything doesn't fall to the Taliban because we know the Taliban, and despite all the rhetorics and everything that." Taliban too, or they have changed or things like that, people really didn't trust and they knew what was coming. So I, I think for, for this part that what will happen next uh, wasn't really a surprise, wasn't very, very question for me, for my family and overall people in Afghanistan, because we have been through 
about the Taliban, had, what kind of people they are, what they have done to this country. But in terms of when, when, com when it comes to looking to future um, and how, especially the pilots and Ahmadi featured in our story of how it's all about for him is now his is and not his present and his future. Um, why the questions like why those who sacrificed their families left them behind to save um, a number of um, aircraft. There's nothing, nothing, and there should be at least a special support for them. To at least somebody should have talked to them, like guys, you you helped us, you 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 did something really great, and we should we should be helped. I mean, I'm, this is a big question for me. I mean, why those guys? Like, I talked to Ahmadi, I talked to several other pilots. They were literally crying for their families left behind. I talked to another pilot who's based in UK, and he cried to me and said, like. We went, I mean, the final days and weeks preceding to the collapse, the war was like so heavy and they risked their lives. They fought to the end, uh, but, but there's nothing for them. They are considered as an, as, an, as an usual or everybody else who has migrated or has been, who have been refugees. So this remains still a question for me. And the reason I, another reason I chose the piece was like, to put it out there, like, are you aware that somebody or a group of people who sacrificed like everything, they cannot sleep, their kids in Afghanistan, they no more recognize their fathers because it's been a year or more than that, that they, they are, um, haven't seen their, um, their, their family members and there's nothing for them. I mean, this would be a question that I want to really want to hear from authorities, like why nothing uh, is happening. And I mean, the migration processes shouldn't be Sacrifice shouldn't be like killing people and their and and like victimizing people with with the, all the um, bureaucratic um, stuff. Um, yeah, and um, I think this is what I I kind of take. I'm I'm thinking about, and so does uh, Mahmadi. Yeah, that's. I think that's right. I mean, I think that uh, you know it's interesting to think that in a, in a couple months' time. Uh, you know, there's a congressional commission that that um, was recently established. Uh, it's the, called the Afghanistan War Commission, and there'll be this kind of massive review. Um, you know, led by uh, appoint, appointed folks who are who are going to be looking into what happened. But I I think, you know, I hate to say this, but I my the cynic in me um, believes that ultimately, like the, these kinds of questions are not going to be either asked or answered. And um, and yet they should be right. And I think if I if I had a few questions, it would be why aren't you asking? Why is it that you you know you find it uninteresting that millions of people um, who you know fought um, for something that the United States said it championed uh, for twenty plus years? Uh, you've just sort of said, yeah, the, the the rest of their story doesn't particularly matter. Um, you know, we, we're not going to highlight that. I mean, today, or I think it was yesterday, there was an announcement that um, the Biden administration has now uh, decided to release, uh, create a special fund um, for uh, for Afghan uh, humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, we hope that will work out well, but, you know, there's always been this debate, whose money is it actually? Is it, you know, U.S. taxpayers? And is it Afghan money because it, since it belonged to the central bank? Um, but it, it's remarkable to me that, you know, while this administration wants to sort of tout these moments, you know, of kind of lending a helping hand, um, there's still a lot of pushback about an evaluation of what it did wrong. Uh, no admission there, you know, no, um, not, not even a sense of, not even a shred of humility around uh, the incredible sacrifices made by so many, uh, even their own people, frankly, who are also reliving the trauma, most likely, um, of what it's like to have left people behind. Uh, you know, lots of American veterans are involved still in fighting to get uh, their friends out or get them resettled. And they're doing that on their own personal time, own personal dime oftentimes. So um, I do think there's still a lot of questions. I'm, I'm curious, Vanessa, um, we only have a few minutes here, uh, I guess, and I, so I'll go around the horn on this last piece. So, you know, you've reported on Afghanistan for a long time. I have too. I think I had a few surprises, but I wonder what, you know, in the process of doing this, uh, working with 
Humaira, with Mir, with Sumaya, you know, with Fahim, Abdul Qayyum, Ilyas, all of our, our fellows, uh, Ali Adili, in the process of doing this, and of course your amazing team uh, who are just unbelievable in terms of their energy and talent, what, was, what surprised you along the way, um, you know, either in the reporting or in the production or even getting to know people? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree, first of all, I mean, that the team at The Intercept that has worked on these projects, I just can't say enough good things about them. Laura Flynn, um, who basically made this podcast happen with, um, you know, just has been working night and day for weeks to make this a reality. And uh, my colleagues, Ali J. Sperry and Murtaza Hussein, who just you know, also have given a ton of time and heart um, to these folks um, to help them. So I'm, I'm really, I'm glad I get a chance to just recognize them a little bit. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things I, I really like about this project, selfishly, is that now that I'm an editor, I don't get to report anymore. And it's a big bummer because reporting is the best and it's where you learn everything about the world and I miss it so much. And so, I mean, getting to go on a reporting trip with um, Fahim Abed, one of our fellows uh, for a story that's coming uh, on this project um, to, to, to meet up with members of the zero units who have been resettled at this Afghan um, elite uh, team that uh, was, was trained and backed by the CIA. Um, you know, going to going to talk to folks from those teams who have, are being resettled here in the United States, and uh, just just getting to sit with Afghans and talk to them in their living rooms over tea, it was just great. And I, I mean, it's a hard, sad, scary story, but it's for me selfishly like that is where I live and that's very rewarding and I've gotten little bits of that with Humaira uh, and being able to kind of talk to her about her sourcing and her character and with Mir and I just want to say you know they've described their projects I think really well and what drove those projects but these are remarkable pieces of journalism particularly from people who are not journalists. And I just can't say enough about Mir and Humaira's uh, meticulousness, dedication, and just complete willingness to be open to learning like how this is done, but also to push back, to, to sort of take very clear positions on what was important to tell in these stories and why we should you know, do them this way rather than another way. Um, that's just been so rewarding. And I, I really hope that people at this event will go to our site, um, theintercept.com and also the Intercepted podcast where the No Way Home podcast that Mir uh, did an episode of is embedded inside uh, as a mini series. Um, but go to our site, please, to read the stories and listen to these podcasts because I, I really think that's, that's the best thing I can say about about why this is rewarding. Um, I think it's really, you know, I'm not just saying this, it's really worth listening to and reading these accounts from people who have lived this. Absolutely. Well, let me, let me give the mic, uh, and we only have really a couple minutes, guys, um, here. So let me, with, you know, let me pass the mic to you because it, this is your story. This has been your journey. Um, what did you learn along the way while working with others on this about yourself or about the process of journalism? If you could sum it up in you know, one or two sentences, what would you say? Mir. Um, yes, I'm grateful to the support we received from the teams at New America and The Intercept. I personally improved a lot in terms of personal and professional development. Uh, for me, the process was a totally new, especially podcasting, a totally new genre. And um, it was, to some extent, it was a bit difficult for me because I was looking at a family story and it required a lot of emotional energy. And uh, that was the toughest part. 
but the support we received, a lot of collaboration, reflections, feedback uh, from the, and the support we received made it possible. And especially the training we had at the beginning, the open source investigation training helped us a lot and we made it. Thank you so much. So glad. Um, what about you, Humara? Yeah, thank you, Candice. I'm the same like Amir. I don't have, I haven't had any background in journalism, so it's been a, a whole new experience and to learn how to do robust and investigative uh, journalism. And I'm so grateful to New America and to Seth, to you, Candice and Vanessa for that. And along along with that, I think the there was an, an acknowledgement in, in the team of our personal circumstances as well. And that was the thing that really touched me because every time we spoke, you guys were like, we are aware of your circumstances. We, we know how you're dealing with it. so many stuff in life. And there was a kind of understanding that that really helped us to do our work, but also, I mean, do other stuff that we have in life in terms of migration processes and shifting homes and all this stuff. Um, and of course, it was an amazing experience to work with my fellow scholars who, from whom I've, I've learned a lot. We have now become a family and hopefully we have the chance to uh, work together in, in future as well. Thank you. Well, with that, we are ending right on time. I just wanna say thank you all. Uh, I wanna say thanks to our partners at The Intercept. Please do go see uh, the site, intercept.com. Listen to the podca po podcast at The Intercepted. Um, no Way Home, it's out and about, and it's worth listening to and check out our articles and hope to see you again soon. Thanks. <laughs>